Need any help? To put me to bed, take my clothes off, hold my head, tuck me in, turn up the lights and tiptoe out. Eve would, wouldn't you, Eve? If you'd like. I wouldn't like. On March 29, 1951, All About Eve won Best Picture at the 23rd Academy Awards, the second Oscar ceremony of the decade. Yes, it's ironic that Mankiewicz's masterpiece set in the elitist New York theater world featuring an unmarried, conniving, queer-coded actress and a bitchy self-made Broadway star rung in a decade of American history known for its suppression of anything that challenged the anti-intellectualist, heteronormative, suburban status quo. Yet All About Eve was the perfect representation of the decade to come. Not despite of Eve's highfalutin sapphic aspirations, but because of them. Eve's villainous lesbian codification and ultimate implied punishment reflected the values and fears of the American public at the time, namely the fear of sex perversion brought on by the Cold War. All About Eve was the first in a long line of films during the 50s and 60s that represented queerness in a way that aligned with the negative consensus about alternative sexualities in the United States. This negative view of queerness on film stayed true during the transition from the 50s to the 60s, even with the liberalization of American social norms and slight changes in the motion picture production code that allowed for implied homosexuality. The change from suppression of any hint of homosexuality in films of the 50s to the exposure and subsequent curing of homosexual characters in the 60s reflected the change in American queer marginalization tactics during this time period. From suppressing and associating sexual perversion with other stereotypical signs of communist inversion during the 50s to acknowledging its existence as a way to further stamp it out during the 60s. Queerness has always found a way into American cinema, overtly and covertly. Donning a top hat and tux, Marlena Dietrich famously kisses another woman in 1930s Morocco. Dietrich's Swedish counterpart Greta Garbo claimed she would die a bachelor in 1933's Queen Christina. Pansies, effeminate male characters, were common in films of the 30s. Though the new motion picture production code, better known as the Hayes Code, forbade depictions or any inferences of sex perversion starting in 1934, queer cinema persisted. Catherine Hepburn kisses a woman while cross-dressing in Sylvia Scarlet. Mrs. Danvers handles her deceased mistress's garments a little too fondly in Rebecca. The Maltese Falcons villain Joel Cairo leaves Humphrey Bogart a business card that smells of gardenias. And 1948's Rope, one of Hitchcock's many queer-coded films, essentially depicts a cast of jealous upper-class gay men. Given this history of queer-coded film, I believe queer audiences at the time likely would have wanted more explicit representation, but the Hayes Code posed a significant obstacle to that goal. Like queer audiences, the Motion Picture Association of America knew that representation mattered. The authors of the 1948 production code reasoned that upkeep of morality in Hollywood films was important because entertainment enters intimately into the lives of men and women and affects them closely. It occupies their minds and affections during leisure hours and ultimately touches the whole of their lives. Depicting the alternative to vanilla heteroromantic stories and characters on screen, like immoral positive depictions of homosexuality and other elements of wrong entertainment, could only lead to the moral corruption of American moviegoers. The censors were in full effect coming into the 1950s. The bits of queer representation that did make it past the strict censors had to mold to the politics of the time to avoid the cutting room floor. 1950s America was defined by fear. Fear of communist subversion led to domestic containment, the promotion of the stereotypical suburban nuclear family, and staunch anti-intellectualism. Fear of sexual subversion led to the rise of psychoanalysis, exemplified in the study of homosexuality by the creation of the Kinsey Scale in 1948. Any threat to the middle-class, naive, heterosexual, all-American way of life had to be fervently stamped out. Driven by anxiety about communist infiltration, Truman's 1947 Federal Employee Loyalty Program led to mass investigations of government employees. The House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, 
also investigated the disloyalty of American individuals. This included the investigation and blacklist of the infamous Hollywood Ten, ten writers and directors suspected of being sympathetic to the Communist Party. After the hearings, the publication of Red Channels influenced the creation of an extended Hollywood blacklist that lasted throughout the decade. McCarthyite anti-communism especially targeted gay people, who were supposedly more susceptible to being churned by communist propaganda than heterosexuals. A moral panic known as the Lavender Scare increased scrutiny in investigating the sexualities of federal employees during the late 40s and early 50s. Republican National Chairman Guy Gabrielson summed up this moral panic concisely in 1950. Sexual perverts who have infiltrated our government in recent years are perhaps as dangerous as the actual communists. Fear of communist subversion and distrust of homosexuals and intellectuals plagued the age of consensus, and in turn, shaped the way queerness was represented on the silver screen. Only people who respect themselves can ever love fully, freely. I don't happen to respect myself. Eve Harrington wasn't the only queer-coded intellectual American audiences laid their eyes on in 1950. In Michael Curtiz's Young Man with a Horn, Lauren Bacall is Amy North, a wealthy psychiatric student who briefly marries Rick, the trumpet-playing protagonist of the film played by Kirk Douglas. She first appears around midway through the film dressed to the nines, sultry and talking in a low, raspy voice slinking instead of walking, referencing Latin words and subverting 1950s romance norms by verbalizing her dissatisfaction after a first kiss, and later seeming altogether uninterested in her heterosexual marriage, Amy is coded as a sensual queer woman, representing multiple fears of 50s Americans. By nature of being both queer-coded and a highbrow intellectual, Amy North emphasized for American audiences that these two qualities easily corrupted by communism were intrinsically tied and dangerous. Before he meets Amy North, Rick first meets Joe Jordan, an all-American singer played by Doris Day. The stark contrast between Amy and Joe helps to frame Amy as unconventional, intellectual, queer, and distrustful. Joe Jordan represents the quintessential ideal 50s woman. She's white, beautiful, styled in modern but conservative fashion, and expresses just the right amount of heterosexual desire. Enough to show that she's interested in men, but not so much as to imply she sleeps around. She's also played by Doris Day, one of the most popular and well-remembered singers of the decade. Even though Doris Day hadn't reached her peak popularity in 1950, her real-life status as a famous singer of heterosexual love songs helps to establish Joe's position as the ideal 50s woman. Amy even spells out Joe's conventionality to Rick. Joe's interesting, isn't she? So simple and uncomplicated. It must be wonderful to wake up in the morning and know just which door you're going to walk through. She's so terribly normal. The line itself, and the undercurrent of distaste for conventionality in Bacall's delivery, immediately frames Amy as Joe's counterpart. If Joe is so terribly normal, what is Amy? Well, as Rick will soon find out, Amy is dangerously abnormal. By contrasting Amy North with an easily identifiable example of a secure, trustworthy 50s woman, the filmmakers made it easy for audiences to interpret Amy, a sultry queer elitist, as an antagonist and a negative example of womanhood according to 50s ideology. Right from the get-go, Amy's intellectualism comes off elitist, snobby, and un-American. Her opting to call Kirk's character Richard, the highbrow version of the all-American sounding Rick, is just one example of this. While showing Rick around her swanky apartment, she talks to him about his alter ego, and when he asks what those words mean and how she knows them, she explains that she studies Latin. The fact that she speaks a language that a normal American doesn't understand further establishes her intellectualism as something foreign and secretive buzzwords for communism. During the same apartment tour, Amy recounts how she paid a piano tutor double his rate to teach her to play a song on the piano. Where Rick was born with a natural talent to play jazz music on the trumpet, a quintessential American music genre, Amy had to use her wealth to learn just one song, showing that she utilizes her intellectual and high-class status to attempt to learn the American coded knowledge she wasn't born with. But then again, Amy wasn't trying to learn jazz. She hates it. She calls it a cheap, mass-produced narcotic, further establishing her intellectualism as wholly un-American. But even though she's an intellectual, Amy doesn't do anything altogether evil. So, 
to really drive home the point that intellectualism isn't something to be desired, Amy herself frames her intellectualism as a bad thing. Me, I've been an intellectual mountain goat, leaping from crag to crag, trying everything. You don't know how lucky you are. Okay, Amy's intellectualism is framed within the context of 50s American values, but is her queerness treated the same? Absolutely. The most obvious expression of her sexuality comes near the end, where Amy meets a female artist with whom she plans on going to Paris. The pair's sexual chemistry is tangible in their one scene together, where they discuss going to the artist's apartment. The other woman gazes at Amy with burning desire, and both women make a point of touching each other's arms. Their brief chat is one of the only times Amy smiles on screen. This moment comes right as Rick is giving up on their marriage because Amy seems to have lost interest in trying to make it work. The fact that her queerness is most obviously expressed at this point in her heterosexual relationship implies that this aspect of her identity brought about the failure of the heterosexual marriage. Amy's queerness is framed as a danger to domestic American heterosexual values. While the negative coding of Amy North's intellectualism and queerness are strong signifiers of young man with a horn's conformity and appeal to 50s American anti-intellectualism and fears of sex perversion on their own, both combine to influence Amy's characterization as a distrustful person. We see Amy's mirror image a lot throughout the film. This motif hints at her being someone with a secret identity, two-faced. Joe later warns Rick about Amy, saying that she's mixed up inside which is also an allusion to Amy's sexuality. But Rick's simple expression of distrust midway through the movie after Amy rejects his advances sums up the attitude the film wants us to have about the way Amy's intersecting character traits affect her trustworthiness. The people I know either like you or they don't. They, they don't act one way and then change completely the next minute. Even though they get married after this, Rick's distrust for Amy lingers and is ultimately one of the reasons why they split up. Young Man with a Horn sent a message to American audiences through Amy North's antagonistic and distrustful characterization that intellectualism and queerness are linked and are both dangerous to the status quo, keeping in line with 50s American tactics for marginalizing queerness. In his groundbreaking book, The Celluloid Closet, Vito Russo argues that 50s audiences' queer interpretations of buddy relationships like Laurel and Hardy's, arise invariably from the fear of homosexuality, seldom from the fact of it. While Robert Anderson's play and 1956 film Tea and Sympathy isn't a buddy comedy, it does play with Rousseau's idea of homosexual interpretations versus reality. John Carr plays Tom Lee, a prep school senior whose interests include sewing, folk music, and hanging out with the faculty wives. He lives with the supposedly macho football coach Bill Reynolds and Bill's wife Laura, played by Deborah Carr. Despite the fact that Tom never even so much glances at another boy with any hint of desire, his peers, his coach, and even Laura suspect that he might be gay due to his preference for feminine activities. There's even a scene where Tom mentions to Laura that he's reading Candida, a play about a young man in love with an older married woman, foreshadowing what would happen between them later. What are you reading? Candida. Uh-huh. Yet, everyone, including Laura, sees him as a homosexual. They couldn't explicitly say the word homosexual due to the production code, but Tom's classmates nickname him Sister Boy early on in the film, alluding to sissy, a term for effeminate gay men. But even though Tom shows all the markers of a shy gay boy in the eyes of 50 society, he's really just a less masculine heterosexual boy. Writer Robert Anderson said that to him, it was never a play about homosexuality. When Bill Reynolds hounds Tom Lee, he's really persecuting what he fears in himself. Although Tom isn't homosexual, the fact that people surrounding Tom identify him as such and, in turn, try to fix him in various ways, speaks to the way psychoanalysis crazed 1950s America thought about and treated queerness. Bill exemplifies the successful case of cured homosexuality, while Tom demonstrates the process of such curing. When I was a kid here in this school, I had my problems too. I used to sit in my room and listen to phonograph records hour after hour. I had a place where I used to go and cry my eyes out. Oh, Bill. But I got over it, Laura. I learned how to take it. In the most obvious allusion to a past struggle with homosexuality, Bill tells touch-starved Laura how he grew out of his lonely music-listening era, 
similar to Tom's, and learned to be a man. And by all markers, Bill appears to be a classic heterosexual 50s macho man. He's married to a beautiful woman, only for a year, but married nonetheless, has a house of his own in the suburbs, and coaches the high school football team, one of the most masculine jobs an American man could have. When his students ask him questions on a masculinity quiz, he picks the most masculine answers. He associates beautiful with girls and fun with hunting. Despite these brazen displays of masculinity, the film codes Bill as still maybe having some homosexual habits. He often avoids one-on-one time with his wife to hang out with the boys or male friends. When Laura mentions her idea for a vacation to Canada, He says he already made plans to go to the lodge with his students. When Laura asks him if he's going to stay for dinner, Bill tells her he's going to eat with Dean instead. Bitter and disappointed, Laura states more than asks, But you'll be back for the bonfire pajama fight. If he can't even commit to a dinner date with his wife, but can make it in time for a homoerotic pajama fight where male students attempt to rip each other's clothes off, the audience can only imagine what Bill must avoid in the bedroom. There's even a scene that suggests Bill and Laura's lack of intimacy. We don't touch anymore. You seem to hold yourself aloof from me and... The scene implies that Laura is not getting her needs met because of Bill's avoidance. Bill brushes this off with the line, It can't always be a honeymoon... But that doesn't take away Laura's clear yearning for physical contact. The presence of Bill's coded homosexuality throughout his life as the perfect American man shows that while homosexuality may be a hard disease to get rid of, it's possible to fight down the queer urges and learn to perform correct male behavior, like getting married to a woman. Bill's subtle queer coding with his simultaneous macho image exemplifies for audiences that the popular conversion therapy and psychoanalytic treatments of the 1950s work. Curing homosexuality leads to a normal, conformist, suburban life. He is an off-horse herb. He's going to have to learn to run with the other horses. Tom, on the other hand, still has a way to go in his journey toward presenting as a masculine heterosexual. But the people around him help him to get there. Tom's dad suggests he get a crew cut in order to masculinize his appearance. Laura tries to set him up with Joan Harrison. His roommate tries to teach him how to walk like a normal guy. His roommate also encourages him to hook up with a prostitute who will tell everyone that he's a true heterosexual. When Tom runs out on the prostitute he was meant to have sex with because she brings up his name Sister Boy, He fails at masculinizing himself and curing his interpreted homosexuality, and so he goes on to the next logical step in stamping out his perceived gayness, attempting suicide. Bystanders knock him out before he can go through with it, and then Laura swoops in as the savior to his queer marginalization journey. In a fairy tale like Scene in the Woods, Laura consoles Tom and kisses him, proving to herself and to Tom that he can be a heterosexual. All he needs is a little guidance. The film's epilogue, where Tom is a married writer, demonstrates that this helping hand from a mother figure helps Tom ultimately succeed in curing his perceived homosexuality. His perceived homosexuality and subsequent curing of said homosexuality perfectly encapsulates the queer marginalization tactics of psychoanalytically obsessed 1950s. Identify the danger of sexual perversion using stereotypical markers based in gender roles and fix it with masculinity. Many marginalized groups of people made great progress in terms of gaining equality during the 60s. Gay people were not one of these groups. Stonewall and the Christopher Street Pride Parade only came about in the last two years of the decade, events which were important to the movement by way of gaining visibility but were only the first steps in a larger gay rights movement. Sodomy laws that made homosexual sex illegal persisted in most states. The American Psychiatric Association still considered homosexuality an illness. Although anti-communism had taken a backseat to civil rights and anti-war movements, the idea that sex perversion was linked to communism and was therefore dangerous didn't just disappear. Even though the primary radical movements which defined the 60s didn't include gay rights in their agendas, the mid-60s did see the start of smaller gay rights protests, like the Mattachine Society sip-in, and, in turn, an increase in visibility. 1960s queer characters were more visible, in part because of the MPAA's amendment to the code allowing for suggested homosexuality in late 1961. 
In keeping with the culture, the mores and values of our time, homosexuality and other sexual aberrations may now be treated with care, discretion, and restraint. But, as the MPAA's statement implies, visibility of gay characters did not mean a switch to positive representations of gay characters. Morality still had to be upheld in the film industry. Queer representation in 60s films reflected American attitudes toward the now more visible gay community. If audiences saw gay people on screen, they had to know that queerness was something to be avoided, punished, or killed. Landing in movie theaters across the country on December 19, 1961, The Children's Hour was one of the first queer films released after the Hayes Code allowance for homosexual implications. And boy, did it take advantage of this allowance. The film follows two women, Martha Doby, played by Shirley MacLaine, and Karen Wright, played by Audrey Hepburn, whose all-girls boarding school they run together shuts down after a spiteful student accuses them of being in a romantic relationship. William Wyler's second go at adapting the stage play of the same name delves much deeper into Martha's homosexuality and its consequences than his 1936 film adaptation These Three does. Even though Martha isn't an antagonist and is depicted in a sympathetic light, her queerness is represented as a malignant character trait. In keeping with Sixie's attitudes toward queerness, The Children's Hour depicts Martha's lesbianism as something to be avoided, punished, and ultimately killed. Martha Doby's queerness isn't just subtext, it's text. But this comes with consequences. Of course, the film doesn't go too far beyond the new bounds of the code in terms of making her sexuality explicit. The censors cut a few scenes from the film that addressed homosexuality more directly, including one courtroom scene where a judge found the woman guilty of having had sinful sexual knowledge of one another. Yet, despite missing some more explicitly queer dialogue and scenes, Martha's queerness is made obvious to the audience in plot, in performance, and in dialogue. In her coming out scene, Martha acknowledges that the little girl's accusations of lesbianism may contain kernels of truth. I have loved you the way they said. Oh, you've got to know. I've got to tell you I can't keep it to myself any longer. I'm guilty. <laughs> There's no doubt about what Martha is confessing to in this scene. She's guilty of the great crime of homosexuality. This coming out scene isn't a positive one. It's a devastating truth for Martha because of the way she and the rest of America see homosexuality as a disease. The increased visibility of Martha's queerness on screen comes at the expense of having to conform to 60s perspectives of how homosexuality should be thought of and treated. Martha takes all the correct precautions to address her sexuality according to 60s ideology. At the beginning of the film, she suppresses her crush on her best friend Karen and rationalizes the only slip-ups in the expression of this crush as just effects of worrying about the school. The audience is first clued in to her crush when Martha reminisces about her first time seeing Karen. The first time I ever saw you, running across the quadrangle, your hair flying. At the time I was running from a chemistry professor. <laughs> I remember thinking, what a pretty girl. While the dialogue itself isn't too suggestive, the cut to Martha's close-up, her change in expression from joyful to almost melancholy, and the softening of her voice when talking about Karen's attractiveness all hint at the internal battle Martha wages against her taboo desires. Later, Martha is slightly rude with Joe, Karen's boyfriend and soon-to-be fiancé, and he takes notice. Why don't you pay tuition then? You could eat three meals a day here. Martha, you've been a little sharp with me lately. Have I? Not only does her cool treatment of Karen's partner represent Martha's jealousy, but Joe's addition of lately implies that she hasn't always treated him like this, that perhaps her jealous feelings, and in turn queer self-identification, are coming to a head. When Martha learns that Karen and Joe are engaged, she can't hold in her jealousy anymore and explodes. But she explains away her reaction by saying she's just worried that the school will fail without Karen. Martha so fervently suppresses and redirects all the hallmarks of her queer desire to the point where she herself doesn't understand the reasons for her intense emotional reactions to Karen's love life. Like a dutiful 60s woman, Martha tries to avoid and suppress queerness like the plague. Though she continues refusing to look inward at her queer desires, Martha, along with Karen, is punished by society for potentially being queer. After the vicious child accuses the two teachers of being in a lesbian relationship, all the other parents remove their children from Martha and Karen's school. When Martha and Karen refute the claim, 
They go to court and lose the case. The town treats queerness as a disease, something the parents fear might spread to their children and which must be identified and quarantined via the justice system. But the fact that Martha is a sympathetic character and is still doing the right thing by suppressing her queerness means that she doesn't lose everything. She still deserves to live as long as she keeps her gay desires locked away. She doesn't go to prison, and Karen remains by her side. Her partial punishment aligns with the treatment of queerness in the 60s. Accusations of queerness must be taken seriously, but if the queerness isn't acted upon, there's still hope for reform and recovery. Martha meets her demise only when she accepts and recognizes her queer desires, even though she's devastated by this realization. After she confesses to having queer feelings, Martha hangs herself. Even the way she dies speaks to her continued conformity to 60s queerness marginalization tactics. Were she an antagonistic character, or one of those people who, as Martha mentions, chose queerness for themselves, it's likely that someone else or some external factor would have had to take her out. But because she's ashamed of her queerness, because she recognizes that it's something dirty that she can't cure, Martha takes it upon herself to rid the world of her sickness. Oh, I feel so damn sick and dirty, I can't stand it anymore! Martha kills her queer desires by killing herself, and in doing so, aligns with the typical treatment of queerness in the 60s. Find it, suppress it, punish it, and, if all else fails, kill it. This is exactly what Martha does. Martha's good deeds are rewarded with sympathetic portrayal. At the end of the film, Karen is horrified that Martha kills herself. Karen never distances herself from Martha, even after her queer confession. In an act of sympathy, after the funeral, Karen walks away from Joe, from Martha's family, from the people who hurt Martha. Yes, Martha was a lesbian, but she did all the right things to try to stop her lesbianism from expressing itself, and because of that, she is never villainized. Martha's clearly laid out lesbian identity and diligent step following of the correct marginalization of queerness makes the Children's Hour a prime example of queer representation in films of the 60s. Years from now, when you talk about this, and you will be kind. The age of domestic containment, fears of communist subversion, fears of sex perversion, and strict ideology about what a person's love life should look like, American society in the 50s and 60s left no room for gay people to flourish in self-identification or expression. The 50s suppressed and framed homosexuality negatively by associating it with sites for communist subversion, like intellectualism, and by identifying it and curing it tracking progress by observing behavior influenced by stereotypical gender roles. In the 60s, negative attitudes about homosexuality persisted, but homosexuals became more visible through increased protest, making homosexuality easier to identify, suppress, punish, and kill. Films depicting queerness during this time reflected this change in queer marginalization tactics. 50s films depicted queer-coded characters as elitist, intellectual, and in need of curing, whereas 60s films more explicitly labeled characters as queer and treated them as such, laying out the steps the characters needed to take to solve their homosexuality. But despite the overall negative depictions of homosexuality in films of these times, it's important to look back and acknowledge that queer representation, albeit negative, did exist. Amy, Bill, Tom, and Martha were only a few of many queer-coded characters in 50s and 60s American movies who made it past the strict censors. The creation of queer-coded characters in films represented a need to address the existence of queerness in real life, because whether the censors liked it or not, queer people have and will continue to exist in the United States. So perhaps, like Deborah Carr says in one of the last moments of Tea and Sympathy, when we talk about queer film during this time, we can be kind, enjoying the crumbs of queer representation and the performances that came with them, which displayed a masterclass in suppression.